and good morning everybody and welcome to Sunday School. I am Mike Carey. Sorry I'm getting on late this morning but uh, church ran a little long. It's first Sunday of the month. It's Communion Sunday and uh, we just had a jam-packed service which is a good thing and uh, just had a really great time and but and as you can tell by the backdrop I decided this morning for some reason I would rather do uh, my live stream from over at the Parsonage and uh, so I had to get ready come over here which was a mistake I probably should have just done it in the office but it is what it is here we are we're getting on <clears throat> just a little bit late and but I got my cup of coffee I hope you got yours and all the cracks in the worship service today about the Vikings and I got my Vikings cup here so just so you know I got my horns out here today so <laughs> and we're in John's gospel we're in chapter one still and um, we're working our way through chapter one <clears throat> rather extensively the reason being is that chapter one is of John's gospel is in my opinion the most important part of the entire gospel because John lays down his foundation his basis his reason for writing the gospel and he also gives us a good deal of theology regarding Jesus Christ and uh, so I, I just think it's it behooves us before we get off into some thematic studies uh, which we will be doing I'm hoping we'll get through chapter one today but uh, <clears throat> It, uh, it's important that we um, get the foundational material before us. And so we're in chapter 1, and we're at verses 12 to 13. And remember, I hope you're continuing to read John's Gospel on your own. Get it firmly in your mind and your heart uh, so that you know what it is we're doing and where we're at. And uh, let's work, read. We're up to verses 12 and 13, by the way. To all those who did receive him, meaning Jesus, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. These were born not of blood, nor of any human impulse, nor of any man's will, but their birth was of God. So, prior in the prior verses before this, he had talked about those who receive and those who reject uh, the Christ. And uh, now he's talking about <clears throat> not so much those who rejected but those who receive those who welcome him and the result what happens to them is that they are given the right to become the children of God uh, <clears throat> because of sin the sin nature uh, we are born sinners we need to understand that uh, and keep that ever before us uh, we are there is nothing in us or about us that appeals us to God we are a sinful people and therefore we are separated from God. And because of that, we have lost our birthright as sons and daughters of God. Um, we talk about the imago dei, that we bear the image of God. In one sense, that's true, but in another sense, um, we've lost that. And so we regain that by becoming sons and daughters of God because of what Jesus Christ has done. This is one of the real significant issues that John brings up before us, that we, because of Jesus Christ, we can become children of God once again. We can have that birthright given back to us. We do not earn it. There is nothing about us that will gain it for us. It is all a work of grace, and it is given to us freely by God because of what Jesus Christ has done. Um, so, you can say, well, you know, I thought all we were all sons and daughters of God in that sense. Well, in that sense, we all owe our very creation and existence to God. But to truly be sons and daughters of God, sons and daughters made new by part of the new covenant, uh, to know true intimacy uh, with God, we have to claim the name of Jesus. Um, that John will go on, and we'll talk about how there's power in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> so, and it's, this is knowing him, having faith 
in him. It's not knowing about him. There's a big difference between knowing about someone and knowing that person. Um, big, big difference. Uh, you can know all about Jesus and not be a Christian. Uh, you can, you know, it's like reading a biography. You can know all the details and everything there is to be known. But until you have faith in him as Lord and Savior, that knowledge does you no good whatsoever. So that is what John is talking about here, uh, that we become his children by faith. Now it takes us up then to verse 14. And uh, let's read that. So the word of God became a person and took up his abode in our being, full of grace and truth. And we looked with our own eyes upon his glory, glory like the glory which an only son receives from the father, or a father, from a father. Um, now I just got some computer issues here, just a second. Let me see if I can deal with those. Um, knock it off here. What are you doing? There we go. There we go. All right. These machines, you get to the point where you can't do anything without them, and then when they go haywire, you can't do anything with them. But anyway, so the Word became a person. Uh, the Word became flesh is how it will read in some uh, translations. This, this is a key verse here. This is the verse that tells us why John wrote the Gospel. Uh, he's been talking about this powerful, guiding, directing, controlling word. The word, John has used that term over and over again. And uh, now he's talking about this, this word is the word that brings order to the universe and order to the mind of men. And, you know, the, why, does he, why is he talking about this anyway? Well, th this kind of terminology and thinking would have been familiar both to the Jew and to the Greek. And remember, John is more of the universal gospel. He's trying to appeal to Jews and Greeks at the same time. And remember, you know, the, the Jewish mindset would be from the Eastern world, and the Greek mindset is more Western. Uh, Greek, you know, they say Rome, the Roman Empire conquered Greece, but Greek philosophy and education conquered Rome. Uh, Roman, its thinking became Greek in many ways. And so now, so the, the thinking, the Greek thinking is more of the Western world and the way the world, they think and do theology and think of spiritual things between West and East is very, very different. Um, so this word, he states, becomes a person, takes on human flesh, and we have seen him with our very own eyes computer is just doing bad things here today. Come on, let's get this back up where we want to be. Oh, no, that's not it. Hmm. All right, well, we'll just keep on keeping on here. And uh, boy, that's just, that's not good. That's not what we want. But, all right. Okay. As long as you can still see me and hear me, I guess we're all right. Um, this word, seeing this word, this word uh, means physical sight. We actually, this is not a spiritual sight. John is making the point here. He's, he's dealing with the Gnostics, and he's telling everybody that uh, this whole thing is not uh, a dream, an illusion, or anything else. That this word, this saying Jesus uh, has come into the world. He has taken on actual, literal human flesh, and we have seen it. That means physical sight. This is not a spiritual vision of some sort. Um, if you want to see this word, this all-encompassing word, uh, you look at Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. That's John's point. Now, this is, this is hard for the Greek to stomach because for the, the idea of that which is divine taking on human flesh, because for the Greek, the body was a prison house. Um, the spirit was shackled to it, um, and 
the ultimate desire was to unshackle the spirit, free it from the constraints and the evil of the flesh. Um, and so the, the good Greek philosopher despised the flesh. So the idea that God could and would become a human being was a totally new concept. Um, leaving eternity, entering time was a staggering uh, new idea uh, for the Greek mindset. So, and the early church had trouble with this thinking as well. There were those called the docetists uh, who believed that Jesus' body was not real, that it was a phantom a ghost. Um, and he could feel, because of that, he could feel no pain, um, no weariness, no hunger. Um, and the early church councils, when you read them, you will see that they are trying to deal with this whole idea. That's another reason why in John's gospel, uh, as you get down towards the end, you have Thomas who doubted, and then you have a week later Jesus appearing, and Thomas says, I, unless I can put my hands in his wounds, I will not believe. And Jesus says, look, touch, see that I am real. And he took a piece of fish and ate it. And so uh, a phantom would not be able to do that. And that's one reason why I believe John puts that chronicle in there uh, to be addressing that whole idea of the docetus. So this heresy was refuted by many of the early church councils. Um, you know, they had disagreements. The church has been having disagreements and arguments from ad nauseum, you know, from ever and a day. It's, it's nothing new. So now there are three words that are common here that John is going to use again and again. Uh, there is the word grace. And the idea of grace has two ideas. It's uh, something, first of all, that is totally undeserved uh, that is given from God. The, God. the idea of God taking on human flesh to do what he did is completely undeserved. We did not deserve that for God to make that kind of a sacrifice and that kind of a commitment to us. Grace also means beauty and charm. And God's, God is not just power. God is also beauty. Um, and so, you know, you may look at Jesus Christ and you may see power, but you also need to see the beauty of God and the beauty of the Christ. So grace is a word now that's going to be used quite common. Uh, and it's used here and will be used throughout John's gospel. There's also the word truth. Jesus is the embodiment of the truth. Uh, he says, I am the truth. Ego a me, I am the truth. Uh, he not only embodies the truth, he is the truth. He communicates the truth. Uh, he left his spirit, um, he left his eternal home, in other words, to communicate his truth to us, to guide us into the truth. You want to know what the truth is? Look at Jesus Christ. Look at his teachings. Uh, this truth he will say in chapter 8, verse 32, this is the truth that sets you free. You've, all, you've heard that said before. Uh, this is also the truth that can be resented and it also can be rejected. Um, just because something is true does not mean that everybody's going to jump on the bandwagon and they're going to believe it right off the bat. Um, sometimes the truth can be rejected. Um, and in light of some of the most outlandish ideas or teachings. But that's the way it is. God gives us that freedom. God is not going to grab us by the scruff of the neck and say, here's the truth now, believe it, accept it. No, God is the one who gives us the power to choose and to decide on our own. And so, and my goodness, my computer today is just doing all sorts of weird things. If all of a sudden you lose me here today, um, it's going to be because my computer is doing weird stuff. Uh, come on here. No, that ain't going to do it either. Okay. Mm. I just got, uh, 
I know I'm still up there, and I know you're still seeing me, but uh, it's my, my screen got reduced by about a quarter here. So anyway, this truth is also not abstract. Uh, this truth is concrete. It is believable. It is something that you can act on. Um, now, this also, uh, this word becomes flesh. That's, that's verse uh, 14. Let's, let's read that. <clears throat> so the word of God became a person, took up his abode in our being, full of grace and truth, and looked with our own eyes upon, we looked with our own eyes upon his glory, glory like the glory which an only son receives from the Father. So this is the third theme word uh, in John's gospel here. Uh, it is the word glory. Um, what John says, you know, first of all, the life of Jesus is a manifestation of his glory. Uh, when Jesus does miracles, such as turning the water into wine, for example, uh, John will say that he manifested forth his glory. John will not use the term miracles at all. Uh, he talks about signs and wonders. He talks about manifesting his glory. So to see Jesus, to experience the power of Jesus and his love, is to enter into his glory, into a new glory, is the term that John will use here for, he, for us. Also, uh, the glory that Jesus manifests is the glory of God, the glory of the Father. It is one and the same. It does not come from mankind at all. Um, Jesus also seeks not his own glory, but the glory of the one who sent him. It is the Father who glorifies him. It is the glory of God that uh, Martha will see with her brother's resurrection when she, he raises uh, Lazarus from the dead. Um, we are told that the raising of Lazarus is for the glory of God. When Jesus is getting ready to perform that particular miracle or manifest his glory that way, he prays. It's a very interesting prayer. Uh, he says that he is doing this not for his own sake, but for the sake of the Father, so that the Father and the Son will be glorified. And he talks in that kind of language, which is strange language to us, but um, it makes perfect sense to him. Um, the raising of Lazarus is for the glory of God. We say, you would think, well, it's for the person that died and for his, his loved ones. No, it's for the glory of God. All that Jesus does and says and experiences is for the glory of God. Now, this glory is also, not only is it the glory of the Father, it's also uniquely his own. Uh, he shines with no borrowed radiance. Uh, it, this is his own. Uh, in one sense, Jesus took off his divinity when he came to earth and took on humanity, took on human flesh. And so when he ministers, he does so in the power of the Holy Spirit. But that divinity is still resident within him and he has to keep it kind of chained in. Um, you see that again in John's gospel. John does a good job of bringing this out. When the mob comes to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and he asks, who do you seek? Who are you after? And the mob says, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And at that point in time, the whole mob is knocked flat on their faces, totally flat. And Jesus asks again, who do you seek? And they're much more, they're rebuked and they go, um, Jesus of Nazareth. And I think what happened there is that at, as he's getting ready, to enter into his passion and his physical suffering. Uh, just the whole thing was so much that he, he let things slip just a little bit. And all of a sudden that mob be, sees him in his glory. They see the glorified Christ and it's too much for him. It just blows him away. And Jesus kind of goes, uh-oh, you know, get my slip is showing here or something like that. And, you got to get this under control. Um, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the Shekinah glory of God. 
when God appears in the Old Testament, is referred to as the Shekinah glory. The pillar of cloud by day and the, the pillar of fire by night. Um, Shekinah means uh, that which dwells. And it is the visible presence of God amongst humanity. You see it in uh, Exodus chapter 16, verse 10. Uh, this is the <clears throat> when Moses went up on the mountain to... Uh, he, he went up twice, remember, oh, a couple more than twice, when he went up and stayed there for a while. And he fellowshiped with God. And Moses said, I want to see you face to face. And actually, Scripture describes Moses as, as one who beheld God and talked with God face to face. Well, that's not quite the case because God says to Moses, uh, that would be too much for you. You cannot behold me face to face. This is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand. I'm going to pass by, and when I pass by, you can look out, and you can see my backside. You can see my, me from the rear, but you cannot behold my face because that's just too much for you. Human flesh cannot endure that, and so he does, and he does, but because Moses spent so much time in the presence of God, his face radiated. It, 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 the Shekinah glory of God rubbed off. And it was so much so to the point where people were scared to death of him. And so Moses had to spend the rest of his days with a veil over his face so that people would not see uh, his glory and be terrified by it. So what we have here now is we see uh, the Shekinah glory of God. When Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, not only does he become blindingly white and purified, but also a shining cloud, as it is described, descends upon them. And this is the Shekinah glory of God. And they hear the voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Um, I, will glorify, I have glorified him and I will glorify myself also. So this, this is the glory that, of God that Jesus kept veiled in human flesh, uh, but was there, I believe, still. <clears throat> and we see it slip and it pops out every once in a while uh, for us to see so that we know that um, this is who we're dealing with here. This is the second person of the Trinity. This is the Son of God. Now this takes us to verses 15 through 17. And let's just... Uh, Get turned there. Come on. Fingers do the walking here. Now, John was his witness, and his statement still sounds out. This is he of whom I said to you, he who comes after me has been advanced before me because he was before me. On his fullness we all of us have drawn, and from him we have received grace upon grace, for it was the law which was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, uh, this is, again, now the one that is, the John that's being referred to there is John the Baptist. Remember, John, the writer of the gospel, will go to some lengths here in the first chapter to put John the Baptist in his place because uh, there were people that wanted to elevate John to a status uh, that was far and away more than what uh, was intended for him. Um, John, is, and he's quoting John here, and he's saying, I, all I did, my role, was to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, the word fullness appears there, which means it's the sum of all, total of all parts. All you need to know about God, in other words, he's the fullness of knowledge of God, is in Jesus Christ. All of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God are in Jesus Christ. In Jesus, you will find all you need to know. If you don't see what you want or what you think you need about God in Jesus Christ, you're looking for the wrong thing because all we need to know about God, we see in Jesus Christ. That's it. So you want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Study Jesus. Study his teachings. Look at his ministry and his life. Uh, the term there, grace upon grace, is used. In Jesus, we find one wonder, basically, that leads to another. Uh, the more we know, the more we know that there is to discover. That's the wonderful thing about the Christian faith. Um, you can, there's always more to learn. 
There's always more to discover. Knowledge begets knowledge. And uh, John Wesley talked about the whole idea of Christian perfection being made perfect in grace. I got problems with that because I believe being made perfect in grace is a relative term because if I get to a point where I'm quote unquote perfect in love, perfect in faith, uh, God is going to take that and take me and he's going to reveal more and new things to me. So it's, it's not like I got to the top of the mountain. I got to a plateau. And once I get there, I can rest for a second, enjoy the laurels of my accomplishment. But then I look up and, and there's more mountain to climb. There's always going to be more to know. God leads us from grace unto grace. And so, um, and also it can also mean the, high, the idea that God gives us every grace that we need. God gives us what we need. Uh, you got a difficult person in your life. Uh, God gives us the grace, will give you the grace, can give you the grace to deal with that person or that set of circumstances. Um, grace is given to us and it's given to us freely. Now that takes us up to verse 18. See, I told you, we're trying to make some progress here today. Um, we need to get on to the rest of the gospel instead of the first chapter. Uh, verse 18, now no one has ever seen God. It is the unique one, he who is God, he who is in the bosom of the Father, who has told us all about God. As I said before, God told Moses, you can't see my face, that's too much for you. But Jesus Christ is the revelation of God <clears throat> and what God is like. Uh, and here's the theme that's stated again. If you want to see and know what God is like, look at Jesus. That's all you need. That's all you need is to see Jesus. Now, the word term there is that is unique. unique. Um, some translations will have it, the only begotten. Uh, monogenesis is the Greek word there. Um, Jesus is God. Uh, his, he is identical in mind, character, as God the Father and the Spirit. He is divine. To see him is to see God. And there, therein comes also part of our theology of the Trinity, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the bosom of the Father there, that term simply means, this is a Hebrew expression that denotes the deepest sense of intimacy because uh, the Father and the Son have this intimacy. Uh, Jesus can show us who and what God is really like and what God is all about. Um, that takes us up to verse 19. Wow. And uh, this is the witness of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites to him from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He quite definitely affirmed and stated, I am not the Messiah. Mm. Now we're gonna get into that here now a little bit in terms of the testimony of John. The Baptist, once again, see, he's done it again in the first chapter. He kind of segues in and out of who is John the Baptist. And the Baptist is put in his place here now. Uh, and John, the writer of the gospel, does so by quoting his own testimony. And John gives three witnesses as to who Jesus is. He gives the, John, the writer of the gospel. He gives the witness of John the Baptist, who says, I am not the Messiah. I'm not worthy to untie the latches of his sandals. So I am the one who comes before to prepare a way. So there's the witness of the Baptist. There's the witness of Jesus' own disciples, uh, of which John is one. And there's also the witness of Jesus' power through his miracles. Now remember, uh, when we get into those, though, John does not call those miracles. They're manifestations of glory. They are signs. They are wonder. But... We get into this, this situation here in starting in, in verse 19. And the Jews now start cross-examining the Baptist um, <clears throat> and asking, okay, who are you? Where are you from? What is this all about? In fact, let's read. Um, he simply says, I am not the Messiah. Well, then, what then are we to think? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the promised prophet? He said, no. So they said to him, who are you? Tell us so that we can give an answer to those who sent us. 
What claim do you make for yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make the Lord's road straight. As Isaiah the prophet said, now they had been sent by the Pharisees, these people. And so they asked him and said to him, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the promised prophet, why then do you baptize? John answered, I baptize with water, but there is one standing among you whom you do not know. I mean the one who is coming after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to unloose. So these things happened at Bethany on the far side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. So there you go. There is the witness of John the Baptist. I, I'm not the one, but I'm telling you right now, he's here. And so <clears throat> you got to get ready. You got to be ready. Now, that takes us up now. Now we're starting to make some headway here. And uh, my voice is just about shot this morning. I've, I've had a cold. I'm just about over it, but still just enough lingering that I'm getting kind of raspy, even with the good coffee. Strong coffee, yeah. But uh, so we'll stop there this morning. Uh, we've also reached our half hour time limit, so the head can endure no more than the seat can withstand. So we'll stop there and we'll pick it up then at uh, verses, verse 19 and through, um, well, let's see, how far will that go? 19 through 28 is where we'll get to next time. So promise me, making some headway here. So. Thanks for stopping by the Sunday school. Sorry I got on a little bit late this morning, but, you know, sometimes that happens. So, so in the meantime, hope you have a great week, a blessed week, and I hope the Lord blesses you real good.